You didn't build a great business by being timid. And now it's time to get back to business the same way you built it, with passion. UBS is here with the resources and knowledge you need today. We've weathered the storm with business owners for more than 150 years. And what we've learned can help you right now, not just for your own personal goals, for your business. With insights and strategies to help you get up and running with the focus and determination that made you a success in the first place. It's a matter of asking the right questions and speaking with the right people who can help you find the solutions to move your business forward. With UBS, the possibilities are endless, but the focus is always on you, your family, and your business. Why not benefit from all of the knowledge and resources available to you from UBS? Few people could have built what you built. Proceed with passion. Good afternoon, it's a pleasure being with all of you today. My name is Lexi Bishop and I'm the branch manager of the UBS South Shore office. UBS is excited to be a part of today's corporate sustainability conversation. With nearly a 25 year record in sustainable uh, investing, UBS was the first to develop fully diversified sustainable portfolios for private clients. Today, we manage close to 500 billion in core sustainable assets and earlier this month, we were very proud to become the first major global financial institution to make sustainable investments our preferred solution over traditional ones for our private clients investing globally. There's no doubt that sustainable investing is a trend that has only been accelerated by the pandemic. Uh, many of our clients today have started to think differently about their wealth and are talking more openly about how to better align their investments with their values, their passions, and the causes that they care most about. Environmental, social, and governance topics are areas that are increasingly affecting a company's performance. From employee health and safety to supply chain resilience and workforce management, how companies treat their talent and manage these issues is important to today's consumers and investors. Before I turn over to Shirley to start today's conversation, I'd like to thank today's guest speakers, Maria Balin Power, Robin Chase, and Mindy Luber, and of course the Boston Globe for their continued work and dedication in bringing together our local business leaders to discuss such relevant topics as today's. So Shirley, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Lexi, and thank you for uh, your support of this uh, series. Uh, and um, I'm Shirley Leung. I'm a columnist at the uh, Boston Globe, and uh, I am here to help moderate uh, this session today. Um, it, this, is, uh, this session arrives during Climate Week, uh, and it focuses on how COVID-19 has not only upended business operations and the way we work, but may also reshape corporate sustainability as global warming and deforestation continues to pose risks. We'll be hearing from three Boston leaders. Uh, Lexi mentioned um, them, uh, and I'll do some formal introductions of uh, Robin, Mindy, and Maria Belen. Um, and, um, but they are leaders on sustainability and environmental justice. Uh, if there's a silver lining to this pandemic, it's this. The virus is teaching the world a very hard lesson on how we need to take catastrophic risks like climate change much more seriously. So I'm here to introduce, hopefully, uh, Robin, Mindy, and Maria can uh, flip on their cameras. Um, so I'm thrilled to introduce them. Um, these, uh, these are three fierce defenders of the environment. Uh, we first have um, Robin Chase, uh, who's uh, Robin. <laughs> She's a serial entrepreneur and co-founder of Zipcar, Viniman, and Numo. Uh, we have Mindy Luber, uh, do a wave, M Mindy. <laughs> she is the CEO of Series, a nonprofit group that works with investors and companies to build a sustainable future for people 
people in the planet. And lastly, we have Maria Balan Power. She's the Associate Executive Director of Green Roots, an environmental justice um, organization dedicated to improving the environment and public health in Chelsea and East Boston. So I've prepared some questions for today's conversation, um, but the audience, you've also pre-submitted questions as well. And if anyone wants to ask a question during the panel, please use your Q&A function during the Zoom. Um, the chat function has been turned off, so use your Q&A function, and, um, and I'll work them into, uh, into the, the program today. So this first question goes to Mindy. Um, because you've worked at Ceres, uh, you know, pushing public companies to be environmentally and socially responsible, I was hoping you could talk about what you're seeing in terms of companies and their commitments to so sustainability in the wake of this pandemic. Oh, you got to unmute. <laughs> you started it beautifully, and I'm going to build on what you said. You said that if there is one thing to learn from this awful crisis of COVID we're living, is that systemic shocks, shocks that upset humanity and our planet and our economy are shocks that we don't want to happen again. And the analogy there, which is stretched for some but makes sense, is that climate change is just like that. It is happening now. We're all witnessing it on the West Coast in San Francisco. We're witnessing it through increased storms and more hurricanes than we've ever seen. That is a growing crisis. And we could either act now or we could act later. If we act sooner, we certainly are not gonna get rid of climate change, it is here, but we could limit it and mitigate it. And had we done that with COVID, we would be far better off than seeing 200,000 deaths. So where is sustainability now in the private sector? We work with about uh, 140 large publicly traded companies globally and 195 investors. And it is a radically different discussion. Five years ago, it was, well, those are cute projects, sustainability. We'll have them you know, on our volunteer day, or we'll deal with them through our foundation. Today, companies, the largest companies in the world and investors understand the profound economic impact, as well as, of course, human impact and public health impact and planetary impact. But climate creates trillion dollar risks for our economy. And those things are rolling out as we see storms that are costing us tens of billions of dollars and forest fires. We're talking about the impacts in a mere two weeks, let alone every day around the world. Um, and companies and investors are seeing the financial impact. They're seeing that every day. And in response, there's not enough happening, but there is substantially more than ever before. When we see Apple and Amazon and Microsoft commit to getting to net zero emissions, meaning no emissions by 2040. Um, when we see Tesla being twice as big and profitable as, or, as GM and Ford. When we see um, Uber talking about changing their fleet to an electric fleet. We're seeing not small changes, but massive changes by these companies and by where investors want to put their money. It's about pace and scale at this point. We need to make change on sustainability. We will run out of water or we will be 30% short of the water we need as a world community in a mere five years if we don't act and change our practices. So much to do at a different pace and scale. But the good news is we are seeing extraordinary progress. When BlackRock, $7 trillion investment firm says to us, we are gonna look at climate risk as part of our analysis for every investment we make and State Street doing the same. We know we're making progress. We gotta push, we gotta push harder, but climate risk is now, it is not tomorrow. It desperately impacts people and the planet and it profoundly impacts our economy. And if we don't act now, uh, we'll see the kind of COVID implications that we def definitely wanna avoid. Now, at the beginning of the pandemic, did you, did you say, uh-oh, you know, the world is coming, shutting down. They might forget about sustainability. Were you a little worried about that in the beginning? It's a great question, and I was. We called every company and investor we worked with and said, how is this impacting you? And they all said, we need a month or two to get grounded, to come up with our corporate plans for dealing with COVID. But interestingly, I thought it would take longer. 
And almost every company and investor is back at it in developing goals and execution plans for how to deal with climate change and water and other sustainability challenges. And they're doing so because their consumers care, because their employees care, their future employees care, and their investors care. It is about now profitability. If you're an apparel company and all of a sudden due to climactic changes, you lose your cotton crop or just a piece of your cotton crop, you may, may very well, as we saw happen to the Gap and Levi's a number of years ago, lose two, 3% of their share value. Now that's come back, but climate impacts profoundly our ability to feed people, to keep people safe, as well as our economy. If you're in agriculture, and the climate changes and the weather patterns change, as we saw last year in California, due to some years it's drought, other years it's storms, you might lose half your crop. And that means the price of food goes up, who we could feed, how we feed them. The implications run to absolutely every one of our lives, our homes, our businesses. The only option is to act at a pace and scale quite different than we've seen. The good news, and we're not giddy over this news because we've got a long way to go, but companies are acting. Uh, they're setting audacious goals and they're figuring out how to meet them. <laughs> Robin, do you want to add anything? I noticed you unmute or... No, I was telling you to unmute. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this next question is for Maria Belen. Um, you know, long before the pandemic, uh, you've seen firsthand the destruction of the environment and the impact on public health because of bad decisions made by corporations. Um, and uh, so describe to us what's going on in Chelsea and East Boston with COVID. I mean, some of the highest rates of infections um, in the state and what can companies do differently so the public health consequences won't be so devastating next time. Definitely, thank you so much for having me. Like you said, these inequities have been happening for decades. Massachusetts was rated as one of them, having them one of the most profound race and class disparities several years ago. So this is nothing new. So to understand a little bit of the context, Chelsea and East Boston are bearing some of the largest industrial and environmental burdens not only for Massachusetts, but for the region. So on the Chelsea Creek, we have 100% of the jet fuel that's used at Logan International Airport. We have over 80% of New England's home heating fuel that's stored on the banks of the Chelsea Creek. In Chelsea, we have one of the largest produce distribution centers in the country, bringing in thousands of trucks in and out daily. And we also have a large salt pile that serves over 350 communities for road salt in the winter. So to understand the context, this is nothing new. We have been sounding the alarms on environmental justice and climate justice for decades. And while nobody could expect COVID to happen, we knew that the very same communities that were gonna be impacted, that will be impacted by climate change were the same communities that were impacted first and worst by the COVID pandemic. At the very beginning of March, we knew that we were gonna shut down and pivot to the pandemic. At the beginning of March 10th or 11th, some of our colleagues and community members were saying, this is gonna be bad for Chelsea. And that's exactly what happened. 80% of our workforce were essential employees still needing to go to work, living in overcrowded housing conditions, having no ability or luxury to socially or physically isolate. So the impacts in Chelsea and East Boston have been devastating. And we knew that that was gonna be the impact of the climate crisis, and we've seen it now with the pandemic. So we really believe that it creates an opportunity for shifting of our system, of our economy, of the way we make decisions. We're fight, we've been fighting an electrical substation on the banks of the Chelsea Creek for years. This is a proposal that would go on the banks of the Chelsea Creek next to 8 million gallons of jet fuel adjacent to a playground in a black and brown community that is non-English speaking. 
And so this is the kind of proposals that we are seen as crazy when we're organizing and fighting these projects, but that's because we know what would happen. We know that black and brown communities and communities that don't speak English as their first language are typically and always excluded from these processes. So we do see the silver lining. We do think there's an opportunity for shifting in the way decisions are made and in the way we look forward, we move forward in investing in our communities, in the most vulnerable and low-income communities and communities of color. Maria, can you um, draw a, 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 a more direct line, you know, just for the audience between what happens when, uh, a, when Chelsea uh, suffers, uh, I guess, uh, has the impact of 100% of the jet fuel? What kind of impact does that have on the health of uh, the residents there? Or when you live in the, you know, the, the, the fuel, the, the, I guess the heating fuel, 80% of the heating fuel you even comes through there. What, what are the health implications and how is that exasperated during COVID? The, 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 their ability to get, uh, I guess, the ability to recover from a COVID. Definitely. I mean, the links between upper respiratory illnesses, asthma, and air pollution are, have been very clear. And so we know that these industries, that there are trucks in and out daily, that we have one of the highest childhood asthma hospitalization rates in the entire state. My three-year-old has asthma, and we live in Chelsea. I, I see no coincidence there. And so the implications for public health impacts are real. And so we already have cardiovascular disease, heart disease, um, upper respiratory illnesses, and then we're hit by a pandemic. Of course, we're gonna have a harder time bouncing back. It, like, like, we've heard it, like we've heard it said before about the pandemic impacting environmental justice communities. It's not that COVID is looking out for black and brown residents and residents of color and low income residents is that we already have the conditions to have a worse impact when we're hit by COVID. So the, the, the air pollution, the lack of access to public transit, to affordable public transit, contributes to the pollution in our community and to us being uh, having a harder time when, when everyone is hit by a pandemic. This next question is for Robin, but did Robin disappear in us or maybe just on my screen? Is Robin there? No, no, Robin. <laughs> uh, hopefully she'll jump back on. So, um, uh, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit. Uh, I'll save, I had a question for Robin, but I'll save it for her uh, later. So um, anyways, I wanted to write, uh, talk to you guys about working from home. Um, so many of us are working from home. It looks like uh, some of you may also be working from home and zooming in from home on this uh, panel. Um, and that has huge implications for the environment with so many of us working home. You know, our, our commutes are non-existent. Uh, and um, so, but someday COVID will <laughs> get under control. Uh, and, um, Bill, but will enough people um, continue to work from home that, to, to, to help save the planet. Mindy, I was wondering if you could start off that conversation. Um, it helps a bit on the margins. We saw for the first two or three months of COVID, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the emissions that create the climate change problem go down. We're actually back to where we were before the shutdown. Um, and I don't think it's gonna make enough of a difference. It may make a difference in our lives. It may change the way we do our work, but as it relates to pollution, I think it's going to be on the margins as it relates to climate change. I will say in the interim period, what we're seeing is extraordinary progress in things like electric cars and hybrid vehicles. As I said, you know, a minute ago, Tesla is now beating Ford and GM together. I predict that over the next five years, the majority of cars in the US will either be hybrids or electric. And in Europe, that's also almost already the case. So there are changes being made. Uh, but I don't know that by working at home, it's going to have a big impact on sustainability or at least on climate change. It may on the rest of our lives. Maria, did, did you want to add anything or? I, I do. I think, I think this also um, uncovers a lot of the inequities. You know, with 80% of our workforce being essential employees, we don't have the luxury to work from home or to stay at home during a pandemic. This, we saw the same with the 
the, the snowstorms of 2015, where the system, the, the MBTA shut down and there were days that folks didn't have access to public transit, that has real implication in people's lives who cannot stay home. That means no work, that means no paycheck, and that means missing out on very, very important bills that they have to pay. And so I think this, uh, the, the idea of working from home also highlights the inequities of who have, who has the privilege to work from home? And then also, if, if we do uh, reduce emissions, which we've seen the impact of people working from home, if, if that doesn't have the equal impact on everyone in terms of do we have hotspot pollution where pollution is concentrated in communities of color, if we reduce emissions overall, but our communities continue to bear the burden of carbon emissions, then we don't see a better world and a more equitable world. Maria Belan, that, that's a great segue into a question about um, another way to look at corporate sustainability uh, when it comes to how companies treat their workers. I mean, that's a, a part of the discussion these days. Um, and so during the pandemic, low wage workers got renamed essential workers, right? And a lot of them got sick and a lot of them, you know, uh, you know, went into work while a lot of us were, were able to work from home and they kept the economy. Um, going and, and functioning. And so when, when you look uh, past this pandemic, um, uh, you know, how can companies create more sustainable livelihoods for essential workers? Definitely. I mean, I, I, I always get uh, very emotional when I talk about this because uh, our folks, our community our members, our residents really put their lives on the line to be the backbone of the economy for Massachusetts and for, for, the, for the entire country. Really putting the, their lives at risk, their families' lives at risk, because we needed to continue, because certain businesses were so essential that we needed to continue. And yet we don't see that impact when it comes to uh, minimum wage increases, when it comes to employee benefits, when it comes to um, healthcare, when it comes to public transit, when it comes to affordable housing. And so I do think that there are very concrete ways that companies can treat their workers, that you can invest in higher salaries, that you can invest in raising the minimum wage, in workers' rights, in immigrants' rights. We know that a lot of, a lot of the folks in our communities didn't seek help because they were afraid, because this administration has created havoc and people do not trust the system. So how would you go and seek help for COVID if you already don't trust it? So there are many ways, there are legislations that are pending in Massachusetts around environmental justice legislation, around immigrants' rights, having access to driver's license, around minimum wage. These issues are all intersectional. You cannot address COVID without addressing overcrowded housing conditions and affordable housing, transit, workers' rights, and so on. Mindy, from your world, I mean, do you see that companies care about, um, you know, treating their workers right, uh, you know, creating a sustainable livelihoods for workers? Um, well, let me start without question. The issues of human rights and workers' rights are in inherently tied to sustainability. It's not just about let's protect the planet. It is about protecting our people. So they are all interrelated. What we're seeing is the following. And as I said, whether it's climate change or water or biodiversity or human rights and being people, we're seeing some progress, but not enough. Now, part of these changes have to be made at a policy perspective, but let's talk about the issues that Maria talked about, which could not be more compelling and what we're seeing in corporate America. One is we're trying hard, fiercely to change who sits at the corporate board level. I will say that Anyone who does an analysis will see a lot of white men who are 50, 60s, 70s. Um, that has to change. You cannot run a company if you don't look like the world you're in. You cannot be sympathetic or empathetic or understand if you don't have diversity. So at the very top, the people who design the priorities for the corporation, that needs to be more diverse. We're seeing some movement towards more women on boards, more diversity as it relates to our brown and black colleagues. 
um, and has to happen and we're seeing movement again, not enough. And CEOs have to be held accountable. You know, they've got metrics for how many products to produce and how much profits to make, but there need to be some other metrics around diversity and around human rights as well as around climate change. Um, and companies need to not only be thinking about what to pay their workers who every day come to work, and I agree, salaries and wages are at the top of everybody's agenda. And companies have a responsibility to limit what they pay their highest people and their lowest um, earning people. But they also have an obligation to look at their supply chain. It's easy to forget the people who are sewing the materials or the clothing or the soccer balls who are in Indonesia or China or elsewhere around the world who may be being paid a dollar a day, not $15 an hour, which is not to suggest changing minimum wage is inessential. Um, but companies need to own and have responsibility not only for their workers, um, but for those who are part of their business, otherwise known as their supply chain. Even if they don't own those companies in their supply chain, they're providing business. And if we have standards in the US for who should be working for those companies, we need to have standards elsewhere and not have nine-year-old girls stitching our products and working 15 hours a day. Um, and I will say that companies, if for no other reason doing repu meaning reputational harm, what it means when a company is called out for having people who are locked in a building in Southeast Asia and cannot get out until they work 15 hours a day, that is no longer something companies do well and survive well. They see their share price go down, they see the value of the company go down, they see the people who want to go to work for them, not go to work for them. They see their investors pulling out and saying, we're going to invest in more responsible companies. So the stakes are higher, they've grown, and issues of human rights and child labor, um, and frankly, minimum wage have to be included as part of the sustainability discussions. Some progress is being made, we've got to start at the top. Boards have to be more diverse and represent the world around them. Great. I'm still trying to find Robin. <laughs> she was in and out. But anyways, uh, I, I know she's trying to get back on. Um, and uh, but I want to I'm going to uh, segue into some questions from our audience. Um, and um, we had um, we had a bunch of questions centered around how COVID has encouraged a, a disposable culture. Um, you know, remember we were, uh, you know, using uh, reusable bags and uh, we were trying to avoid uh, disposable utensils, but, you know, think what restaurants had to go through. They had to uh, restrict themselves, many of them to take out only. So there's a lot of uh, utensils, disposable utensils, or a lot of plastic containers now for takeout. Uh, or think about the businesses that have retailers that have reopened and they have to buy disposable masks and gloves in uh, bulk. And <laughs> hi, Robin, you're back. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, welcome back. Uh, and so, so how do restaurants and businesses be eco-conscious during a pandemic? Um, and, and is that something that, 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 that I mean, I, I think about, uh, you know, the, the number of masks and gloves that you, you find on, on the road, you know, on the, on the sidewalks and, and on litter actually right now. And so uh, what, what can be done about that? You know, it is a real dilemma because we want to stop the spread of the virus and reusing certain things doesn't help us to do that. And I think for a short period of time, we're going to have to learn to live with it. You know, PPE, all of the different coverings that hospital workers use and the masks and the robes and the gowns, um, there is no way to reuse them in most cases. Now there's a lot we could do to build a circular economy to reuse big things like our over consumption and throwing away of refrigerators or our mobile phones. Um, there's much we could be doing to recycle, to reuse materials uh, but I do think COVID brings an exceptionally unique moment in time when we don't want to reuse somebody else's mask. We don't want to reuse as healthcare workers who are doing the Lord's work, and I'm not religious here, so, but they are doing work for all of us and we want to keep them health, healthy and safe. Um, so I asked, I asked one of my friends who um, works in plastics and she was remarking as Mindy alluded to here, that we need to have already done, and we could be doing now, 
this reusable containers. What is what does that look like, and how would that work? I feel like there's one local shop that I've been I've been trying to keep alive, and I do have a stack of their reusable containers that are all washed and nicely done, and they keep sending them back out. I think why is it that we don't have a system where I can go return them and and to them that they can wash them once in big stacks? I don't know, but we have. It's just pointing out how all the things that we haven't done already, we should have done. If we had, had we done them, we would not be facing as miserable a situation as we have now. I guess uh, something that had, had I been on, I would have said is, is we really hadn't worked on resiliency in our, in our healthcare, in our transport, which is something that I care a lot about and in how our companies operate. And because we were so rigid, not thinking, not provide, not thinking about really working in resiliency that we now are faced with this disaster that we are seeing now. Robin, talk a little bit more about that. Uh, examples of how, um, you know, how you know, can we build, you know, can we build a more uh, a resilient system now? You know, whether it's transportation or or a circular economy with uh, with utensils and cups. I mean, I, one of my last stories I did uh, in January is about the, the the trend of reusable coffee cups, uh, and and there's a whole system being built, um, and and there's actually you know, uh, pilots all over the country where uh, people would use mugs or have a system of washing rather than using um, these disposable coffee cups. But uh, share some thoughts on how, like, how can we build a more resilient system from the ground up if, if we, we are able to hit the reset button? <laughs> um, I feel that one of the things that COVID has done for us is it's I want to say from a climate and transportation perspective, it's, it, it's reminded us of things that we hadn't been paying attention that we either never saw or we forgot were important, like clean air. Wow, that's great. Blue skies. How fantastic. You know, congestion free calmness, the importance of health care and access to health care in general. Being, and, and the idea of essential services, like none of us even, was that even a word in our vocabulary before? Essential services and how we personally or as workers get to them. So as I, I look at this and I think of all the intended things, so in my, in my realm, I'd say in transportation, there's this idea that, oh, everyone's got a car, they can go someplace by car. And only 5% of American workforce goes by public transit. Well, it turns out that 23% of black households use public transit to get to work. They aren't 5%. And 28% of all essential workers are using public transportation. Um, so had we been paying attention to those facts, we would have built a more resilient system in there. So if I go to, I feel like I think, think of the audience, I think we have large, large companies and small companies. And sometimes as small companies, we feel more powerless. But what I think COVID hopefully will put into us is we will elevate the value of equality and sustainable as a future that we aspire to. And so COVID has completely weakened the hold of the status quo on us. And we have this opportunity to shift our priorities all across. So I was just looking at something dead simple that any company of any size could be doing right now, which is in Massachusetts, have you signed up for renewable and electricity? Like and it takes nothing, it would be a percent or two, but it's demonstrating I care about that. I'm gonna do that. Have you, you know, have you thought about your employees and the people who are your customers? How are they getting to work? Do you have you are you discriminating and making it sure it's only people who get there by cars? Where have you located yourself? What are you doing to provide on those realms? You know, as I've overheard you speaking, you know, who are your suppliers? Are you choosing and are you thoughtfully thinking about what is the world that I want and I care about? So am I choosing Am I favoring local? Am I making the effort to do local or minority businesses? So we have to shift our priorities and do those things. And I just want to recognize this disparity between big companies and small companies. I felt when I was a very small startup that all I, what I needed to do first was make a sustainable company. I want to appreciate what you need to do first is make a sustainable company. But some of those choices you can do simply and quickly. Um, but as a bigger company, you have absolutely no excuse. And as Mindy has pointed out, 
youth today, and I want to say more than youth today, people who are in their 30s and 40s and 50s want to work for a place that cares about that future. And so each one of us, as we make, as we think about our suppliers, the work we put in, and as our customers, we need to be making our value system. We need to be holding our same value system that we would hold in our, house, in our homes and our families to extend to our companies. And that I think has been a big disconnect in the US that we, we have one set of standards for one and another set of standards for the other. You know, Shirley, if I could just build on that a tiny bit. What Robin's talking about it are practical things that could enrich our lives. Some of them are small, some of them are big, um, but they are all doable. And to get part of the doing it will take policy changes and it will take all of us speaking out. After the election, my guess is there will be, from everything we're all hearing, a two or three trillion dollar infrastructure bill to help us build out the economy from COVID. Some of that will go to straight resources for individuals, but some of that will be building out our economy. That's more money than we have spent uh, almost ever on building infrastructure. And it could, be, it could have major implications. It could be the difference between the world we have now and a clean energy and transportation future. That will be good for citizens. It's not a bad thing to have livable communities where people can walk places or to have airplanes that are running on sustainable fuels, not being one of the highest emitters of pollution or to have homes that really are truly energy efficient and to have you know, steel and cement and the major things that are polluting now be made differently. We could build out our communities in a way that gives us a greater sense of community, uh, more walking, more mass transit, fewer cars, uh, or car sharing. More bike, bicycle infrastructure. Or bicycling, to, absolutely, Robin. That is good for all of us, as well as will have a profound impact on our economy, our communities, and building out and preempting some of the worst damages of climate change. Mindy's reminding me of one other point, and Maria Belen, I'm, I, <laughs> you absolutely should be speaking as well, um, is I f if I think of the litany of things that companies, small and large, can be doing, among them, and this is Mindy's life's work, is we, as companies and as individuals, need to express to our government that these are our priorities. And I, I, I want to say, I almost feel like when I think about the difference between what I would do as a family and what I would do as a company, I want to even put it more succinctly. What, would you, what are the ethics that you would encourage your, do, your, your child to do? And, and so, okay, this could be a slightly harder thing, a slightly more expensive thing, but it's the better thing. It's the better thing for our future and it's the ethical values that I want you to, to adopt. So as Mindy um, explains, we are going to put a ton of money in this and each and every dollar we spend as a government profoundly needs to get us closer to a decarbonized world without, I can't even express the, the gigantic importance of that. This is our one last shot at doing it. And some of these choices will be making our lives better and nicer. I'm about to get an electric bike. And if you haven't done electric bike, it is exciting. You feel like Superman. You feel like a superpowers. Um, but the corollary is our government needs to make a safe spot for us to get around. Like, and going to back black and brown, brown people, they are die, their pedestrian and bicycle death rates are higher than they are for white people. So again, it's an equity issue. Focus on that problem. And this is something that's valuable to them. But some choices, recycling my takeout is more irritating than throwing in a trash can. Yep, it's more irritating. Live with it because I know the future that I want. And so we need to, um, I think there's many, many things that are going to be better. And, and that's coming back to COVID. There's things that we had forgotten are valuable to us and community and localness and less consumption and more caring about local services. I think we've all experienced that today. And so we need to remember that. Maria Belen, what would you like to see for East Boston and Chelsea in terms of, uh, you know, if this infrastructure bill comes uh, to fruition, you know, what would help, what would make 
East Boston, Chelsea more livable uh, and, and, and right some of the environmental wrongs there? Yeah, I was thinking just uh, right now about, you know, if, if we think about what is the sustainable way we, we look at the transportation sector and how much it contributes to carbon emissions and we really need to invest in mass transit. We really have to ensure, we're seeing you know, the news today and, and the last couple of days of the MBTA looking at huge service cuts because of a deficit. And so that cannot be the way forward. We have to invest in the public transit system, in the MBTA and in the RTAs, the regional transit authorities, across the Commonwealth that are serving other environmental justice communities like Chelsea and East Boston. I would say, you know, also the piece about electrification, electrifying the grid and electrifying mass transit would be incredible. We have to do it. And also we have to look at how we do it. The electrical substation on the Chelsea Creek of East Boston, some folks would say that's part of electrifying. We have to electrify the grid, so we are going to need more electrical substations, but not at the cost of the lives of black and brown communities. And so the, the entire system has to shift on how decisions are made. And so I would say the money needs to go to mass transit, to public transit infrastructure, to operational and capital investments in public transit, as well as affordable housing. Our folks are being crammed into housing conditions that are just not humane. We know many, many, many families in Chelsea and East Boston that rent a room, entire families living in a room because they cannot afford an apartment for their own family. And so when we see the investment in climate resiliency, we fear that those investments would go to luxury condos and that those monies would be to go and support the investment of development on our waterfront. That's not the investment that our communities need. We need affordable housing that is deeply affordable. You know, the area median income for our region, it doesn't apply to Chelsea. Our, our wages are so low that the 30% of the area median income is too high. Our folks cannot afford affordable housing right now. So we need investment in mass transit, in public transit infrastructure, both operational and capital investments, as well as affordable housing so our folks are not displaced. You know, we see we fight for environmental justice, and the more beautiful and healthy our community becomes, the more expensive. So the very same people that have put their lives on the line that have worked so hard for our communities to be livable are being displaced. And they're being displaced to communities that are again, be an attack on their health, that are not healthy, that are again, next to hazardous facilities. And so we have to invest in transit and in housing as two key determinants of health. Um, I'm going to go back to questions from the audience. Um, there's a, a question, an interesting question about non uh, about uh, to nonprofits. Like, let's say you're a nonprofit. So, how can nonprofits make themselves known to and adapt to companies' corporate responsibility models in the pandemic and post-pandemic world? So, if you're not a company but you're a nonprofit, how do, how do you how do you get engaged on this? Well, it's an interesting thing question because. That's all we do. Ceres works to integrate sustainability into capital markets by working with the world's largest companies and investors. Um, I find the, the movement towards stakeholder capitalism, and we're certainly not moving away from profit-driven capitalism, but so much of what companies and investors think about are short-term earnings. And there is, there is some energy and fair amount of movement, certainly what we're pushing to, taking a broader view. And what that means is don't evaluate things based on how much money I can make in the next 15 minutes or the next month or the next quarter. Take a longer term view. Um, don't think you have all the answers. With almost every company we work with, we run a stakeholder engagement plan, meaning we want them to hear from people in the communities and people with different backgrounds and people with diversity. And so there are processes that companies run um, and that NGOs run for them that bring in people from all across the spectrum. 
Uh, I don't think there's one easy answer, but like um, our sponsor, the bank that opened this, she's a branch manager. She's not un unattainable or unreachable. She's in the middle of a community, and I think she would welcome people going to talk with her about what the needs are for that particular community. It's only a start. I'm happy to talk with folks offline to get them, to get them some more help and advice. Maria Berlin feels like she is that example. I mean, I guess I would say that, you know, we're a nonprofit. We're, we're not, you know, we're a very small grassroots organization that's working to organize our residents. Um, there are large, large nonprofits like hospitals and, and huge that really operate like corporations. And so I don't think there's a difference between what a nonprofit can do versus a corporation. I think all companies, all organizations have a responsibility to A, look at the people that are closest to them. Who are your lowest paid workers? Who are your most vulnerable uh, members of your team? And how do you make sure to include them in the decision making? That is, that's probably, probably the hardest thing to do is the most internal and the thing that is not public that folks are not looking at. How do you treat your workers that are the most vulnerable? And then as a company, as an organization, nonprofit or for profit, how are you investing and in protecting those that are in the front lines, those that are the hardest hit? those that are at the risk of being hit the hardest by COVID or by climate change. So one thing I do want to say is speaking out and speaking loud, whether it's to change companies or change policies is essential. When I was the regional administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency in New England under the Clinton administration, the East Boston community spoke so loud to me about not building another runway. They were in my office, they were clogging my fax machine and clogging sounds bad, it was nothing but good to get that. We changed our decisions based on the incredibly thoughtful voices, clear science, materials, but the impact on local communities. It didn't happen easily. Our scientists weren't the first ones to see the problems. Our policy people weren't. There were individuals and citizens who lived near that airport, near that runway, who were in our office. And so I wanna always encourage people, the decisions being made by regulatory agencies, by policymakers, by companies, they should do it intuitively because it's right, because it is about protecting people, the planet and making money. They're no longer divergent things. Uh, but if they're not hearing us, we need to talk louder and scream louder um, because these are essential issues. We can build a future economy that really is about good jobs and clean energy or keep putting people in coal mines where those coal companies are doing poorly. People are getting sick. They're working in intolerable conditions. It is not acceptable for 2020 or any other period of time. We need to look out at what is the future, and I'm talking about five years, not 50 years from now, and do things like strengthen our public transportation, particularly in communities where people have no other way to get around, and change the efficiency of our homes and build different kinds of communities. It's doable. It will take policy. We need to make sure there are incentives for small energy as well as oil and gas companies, which have been incentivized for four decades or five decades and change the debate. Um, but a lot of it does come from exactly what we just heard Maria Bolin tell us about, which is grassroots voices can be heard and are heard. And the last thing I'll add to that is that the business sector has played also a role in, in the work that we do. And you know, a lot of businesses wrote a letter to the Boston Business Journal in support of environmental justice legislation. And so that's the kind of support that we need. For, for us, we will continue to do our bread and butter work, our, our daily organizing, grassroots door knocking, engaging the most vulnerable, but we also need allies to speak up in favor of the policies that are the solution and against the proposals that are so dangerous. 
I'm going to go through some more questions from the audience. Uh, these are some of the live questions that come about. Um, this might be good for Mindy or Robin. I don't completely understand this question, but, but maybe Mindy, you might, uh, this might be your world. Uh, many big tech players like Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple stand to benefit materially by disruptions to the supply chain that would result from climate change legislation. So how can we take their commitments seriously? Well, I'm not sure precisely. Um, one thing I will say is that for all of these large companies, tech companies in particular, but others, there are still some that say, I'm a great climate champion or a sustainability leader. And then their government relations offices are opposing climate policy or their trade associations. I mean, we have said clearly moving forward, inconsistency no longer cuts it. I mean, it should never have cut it. But if you want to be a climate leader and you want to set audacious goals for your company and your supply chain and everything involved, you've got to support policy. You can no longer get away with having that kind of divergence. And so if there are examples of the companies that we're talking about who are doing, who are either denying climate or supporting policies that oppose it, or that are unfairly treating workers in their supply chain, we will call them out and they should be called out because people want to work for companies that are consistent across the board. And investors are now saying to companies, we will invest in you if you've got leadership and you're showing that on sustainability and that's broadly defined. Uh, and if there's inconsistency and you're you know, a sustainability leader on Tuesday, but not on Wednesday, we're less inclined to invest in you. And, and they're not necessarily even making that decision for moral reasons, investors. They're saying, as a company, we don't consider you well managed if you're not looking at fair and equitable sustainability programs. Um, I have another one, one last question for the audience, and then I have a, a wrap up question for you guys. Um, this is, this is a, a question about carbon emissions. <laughs> and um, the person writes, I don't understand the emphasis on carbon emissions. Uh, you know, one vol, you know, uh, this idea is that why is it, why are we so focused on carbon? Uh, it, it seems like if, if all of us gave up our cars and rode bicycles to work every day, uh, it, it would, would it really make that big of a difference uh, in, in carbon emissions? Why not focusing, why not focus on reducing harmful pollutants such as sulfur and mercury? So we spend a lot of time, as do I'm sure all of us, on methane emissions, which are very toxic as well and create add to the climate problem. Mercury deals with, it in some ways, a different issue, but it is insidious and pernicious, and we should all be fighting to make sure the mercury rules stay in place, and, and uh, methane rules are being rolled back by this administration, all of which is poisoning our families and our communities. Uh, so I agree, it is not just about carbon pollution or transportation, but think about it. Going into the last couple of years, the largest area of emissions were were coal, and, and, and that has been cut back substantially in the United States because of public opinion and the economics of dealing with coal, which are no longer economical. Um, right now, transportation emissions are the largest in emissions overall impacting. So it's but one place. It's an important place because there are clear solutions that Robin has led and talked about, um, but certainly uh, your listener uh, with questions is absolutely right. Let's not, let's not forget the big picture. And, and I hope we're all doing that. Mm -hmm. all right, I, I lied. I have one more question. <laughs> we're going to have two more questions. Uh, one is, um, Mindy, this is another question for you, which is, um, uh, you know, we know that there's a record amount of money going into sustainable funds this year. And, um, can you talk about like what happens when this money goes into sustainable funds? And um, Lexi had mentioned this at the beginning of the, the conversation. Um, and how does that help the planet? Yep. A, a lot of things. I mean, first of all, if money keeps getting invested in coal fire power plants, which much less money is going in or oil and gas, we are propping up an industry that really is on its way down. It's value has gone down substantially over the last three years more than anyone has ever expected. Mindy, if Mindy, invest, I just want to interject, or please. more highways that we don't need is another thing instead of mass transit. That's right. So if investment dollars are going into clean energy, renewable batteries, 
electric vehicles, different kind of housing, um, we will see that world that we want to see, which is a cleaner, more prosperous world. Um, that's where we want our dollars to go. There is no question in our society of capitalism that sustainable capitalism, you can still make money and so on, but we need to look at where we're putting our investment dollars because it matters. And banks that are putting their dollars into high carbon emitting projects or companies are being called out by the grassroots, people are pulling their money out of those banks. Um, it is time and it is profitable to invest in more sustainable companies rather than those companies that have brought us the climate problems and many other pollution problems that we're suffering. My husband has this sentence that he gave me that I love, which is infrastructure is destiny. And we are reaping now that infrastructure, that fossil fuel based, unequal, unhealthy infrastructure that we built. And if we want to get out of this, we need to build new infrastructure that supports a new way of living. And so I, I, there's this statistic that I feel like I just keep rolling forward, which was you know, the infrastructure, half the infrastructure we're gonna need by 2050 has yet to be built. And so each and every one of these decisions that we make is building that, word, word, that infrastructure that becomes our destiny. So we built highways and sprawled housing and we get congestion, obesity, and climate change. Like, Obviously, when you build those things, that's what happens. So we need to do much more mixed use, dense housing with different income levels who can afford it, mass transit, I love that. active lifestyle, all those things. I love that. Infrastructure is destiny. That's great. I'm going to steal that <laughs> too. Um, anyways, last question for me. It's kind of a, 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 you know, a wrap up question. So when you guys look ahead, uh, let's say five years from now, it's 2025. And let's say we're all, all optimists, okay? We, we're, we've learned something from this pandemic. We're changing our ways. And, and the world is truly on a path that reverses the big damage that we've done to the planet. You know, how, how will that be apparent to, 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 to you or to everyone? How, what, what do you see? Uh, Maria Belen, if you could start us off. Sure. I mean, there are some very concrete things that we are working for that we hope to achieve and to have won by 2025. And so, you know, we would see a, a Chelsea Creek waterfront without an electrical substation. We would see an investment in public transit, uh, ideally public transit that is free, that is not funded on the backs of the riders. We would see, um, uh, and and that, it's, that, that it's through progressive revenue streams, that we're not creating structures that are hurting m poor people more, but that we are taxing the folks that really should be contributing more to our public infrastructure. We would see environmental justice legislation approved, passed, and implemented in the Commonwealth. We would see further policies protected in our communities. And like Mindy said, we would have uh, the, the government, companies, corporations, nonprofits represent the, the world that we live in. We would see more women, more people of color, black, indigenous, and people of color that are at the leadership level and that are at the decision-making table. Folks that are low income, people of color, and non-English speakers. You know, language justice has been a cornerstone to our work. The folks in East Boston and Chelsea keep continuing to be excluded because of language. And that is such a basic, basic human rights and civil rights issue that is beyond uh, what we're able to do. And so we should, we really need to invest in the folks that are our community and that we, our organizations, look like the world that we live in. Great. Robin or Mindy? Um, I want to agree with everything that uh, Mary Belen just said. And so maybe adding on, I hope in five years we have real democracy, which means that um, the things that the majority of people believe actually are getting done. And so those have things with concern around climate change, concern around inequality, concern around gun control, concern around healthcare, all of those things are true. Then I want to go to what it would feel like to live in that world on a very intimate level. I think that in five years, if we did the right investments, we would be living, more and more of us would be living in what's called 15 minute cities. 
that my ability to go to essential services, as in the grocery store, a health clinic, some recreation, to my friends' houses, I can do without getting into a car to do it. And to make that very intimate, imagine that your eight-year-old can go see their friends without you having to get them there. Imagine that you know people are working and living in much closer proximity because we built dense, affordable, mixed-use, mixed-income housing so that we are living lives that are more local and, and I wanna say more friendly, more livable. We're not fighting the transportation nightmare that comprises all of our days that we've just ignored and getting the 50% of people who don't have a car at the second don't have to wait on the other 50%. They can go do what they want. So much more freedom, freedom and more livable. Mindy, we have three minutes left, but you can only use one minute. <laughs> okay, one minute. One minute is I want to believe that we're getting closer to sustainable capitalism, a capitalistic system that we have that integrates the values of sustainability, not just as moral values, but as financial values, because that will change decisions. It'll change boards. It will change th what things look like. And then a few specific things. We don't need to run our lives on oil and gas and coal and high pollutants. We could run it based on wind and solar and other energy sources that create local jobs and better jobs. And we wanna make sure those jobs are good and fair and equitable and paid well. And we wanna make sure transit systems are being supported and running through neighborhoods that don't have other options. I think we talked about housing. Um, we need to make sure our healthcare, whether that's in the sustainability definition or not, serves everybody. Um, and we need to have a more diverse perspective on running our institutions in our world. Well, thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Mar Maria Belen. Thank you, Robin. I'm going to hand it back to Lexi Bishop from UBS. Thanks, Shirley. And thank you to our speakers, Mindy, Maria Belen, and Robin. Um, great insight today. And clearly, you know, there's still a lot more that needs to be done in terms of corporate responsibility. Um, so to our audience, I would encourage you to visit our website, UBS.com, for more insight on sustainable investing and corporate responsibility. We have some great insight there. Uh, we talked a lot about a lot of topics today, and there's ways to incorporate, whether it's um, pay inequality, climate control, Whatever's important to you, there's a way to incorporate it, incorporate it into your portfolio. Um, so with that, um, thank you for your time. And our next program will be on October 6th. It's going to, the topic's gonna to be higher education, inequality and, and opportunity. Uh, we're gonna hear from the Chancellor of UMass Boston and we're looking forward to uh, sharing some more insight with all of you. So thank you again for your time. Thank you.